Good morning, friends. Our scripture reading today is going to come from Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. That concludes our Bible reading. Thank you, Paul, for that reading. Glad to see everybody here today. It is good to look out and see you. Sometimes when I come in, I think there's about 20, and then we grow. That's good. All right, let's say this together. This is my Bible. It contains God's will for my life. I can become what it says I can become. Today, I will study from his word. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'll never again be the same. Praise God. I want to talk today about the Lordship of Jesus. The Lordship of Jesus from the standpoint of being a disciple. What we just read in this scripture says the same message. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say. I find languages fascinating. I wish I'd found them fascinating at a much earlier age. You know, some things translate well from another language. It's just seamless. And there are other things then that just don't translate at all. Someone, you're speaking and they just have to stop and for the next, you know, several sentences and some questions they go on and finally the concept comes out. I don't think it's an accident that the New Testament was written in the Greek language. The Greek language is a very expressive language in which you can take and find the right word to just about say whatever it is you want to say. I learned a few years ago from a friend, he said, we have a problem with the Spanish language, and I asked him what it was, and he said, well, it's the word senor. He said, senor is basically the same word we use for mister. It's like senor Rodriguez, senor Williams, senor Smith, or Mr. Sw Mr. Rodriguez, Mr. Williams, Mr. Smith. Now, the result is that the the concept of Lord is a little bit weaker, but they're not alone. To call Jesus Lord or, or Mr. is not very strong. English has a similar problem, but for a different reason. I think we, though we have two separate words, one for Lord and one for Mr., I think our word, word has lost its power for another reason, and it could be any number of things, but one of them may be because of our, our past history of like the lords of England, some of which who were not very savory characters. Lord doesn't mean today what it meant when Jesus was walking and trotting upon earth. Back then, the Lord meant maximum authority. It meant first one. It meant one above everything else. The Greek word kurios translated Lord when it's not capitalized simply referred to a way that a slave would refer to his or her master. But if it was capitalized, it referred to only one person in the Roman world, Caesar is Lord. You can see then why the Christians would have a problem. You can understand why persecution would result from their commitment to the Christ. Now it's not because 
Caesar was just jealous of the name. It was far deeper. Caesar, Caesar knew that they were committed to him in some things, but they were really committed to another authority. And that's what really got under his skin. When you're forced to say, well, we can count on, see, Caesar, you can count on us for some things, but when it comes down to choosing really important things, we're going to stay with Jesus because we have made a commitment to him to be faithful. Caesar's Lord or Jesus' is Lord. Now, it's easy to sit here this morning and easy to look at those scales and easy, easy to say, I would be on the side with Jesus as Lord. It came up this morning in our Bible class about people that are persecuted unto death. There is about 15 or 20 people worldwide that die every week because of Jesus. I understand that intellectually, but to wrap my mind around that and to see that and to hear some of those stories, yeah. Now we said before, Jesus is maximum first above all, but in this case, when you talk about Jesus is Lord, he's the owner. He created everything, not just around what Caesar could see, but he created the universe, the world, put order to it. He is the one above everything else. That's why he is called Lord. The message of the four Gospels, and we're going to shift just a little bit here. The message of the four Gospels is about Jesus and the kingdom of God. In fact, Matthew uses the phrase, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like, the kingdom of God is like. 30 times he uses that in his book. It doesn't occur in any, of the other, in any of the other books, the Gospels. In Acts chapter 1, after his suffering, after his death, we just celebrated, Jesus showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke of the kingdom of God. Of God. From this verse in chapter 1 to the last verses in chapter 28, the kingdom of God and the lordship of Jesus occurs again and again. All right. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy. In the Holy Spirit, Jesus would say, my kingdom is not of this world. That would be important where he says to the Corinthians, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but a matter of power. We say, don't just talk the talk, walk the walk. It's, not, it's one thing to just talk in gen generically about the kingdom. It's another to understand the significance of the kingdom as set forth, especially by Jesus. Jesus' kingdom was absolute authority. He was at the center of his kingdom, and his kingdom was the center of his message. In our current world culture, we hear <clears throat> of another gospel. Some call it the fifth gospel. It's human-centered man-oriented. It's the gospel of Jesus in terms of it's a big offer. It's a hot sale. It's a, he's an ear. He's just a deal that you can't do without. We hear people say, if you'll just accept Jesus. When I, when I hear that every time, I always think therein lies the problem. You mean, do I accept Jesus or does Jesus accept me? Televangelists will say something like, oh, poor Jesus is standing knocking at the door of your heart. Or, poor Jesus is out in the cold. Won't you let him in? Now, Jesus is pictured as standing at the door of our heart and knocking. 
But he's not a cold, small, trembling Jesus. He is the Lord of the universe. And that Lord is knocking at your door. Someone says to me in, in that context, you know, Jesus is standing out in the cold board. Jesus, well, it, it makes it sound to me like I would be doing him a favor if I just become a Christian. Preachers in the world talk about Jesus in terms of health and prosperity. I clicked on a couple of things yesterday just to make sure I wasn't, I, th I thought maybe they'd gone away, but they hadn't. Talk about if you'll give $20 back, you know, he'll give you 40. If that, and, and by the way, when you give, you're blessed. But if there was a guarantee every time you gave 20,000, you would get 40,000 back. Our boxes in the back would not be big enough and our bank accounts would not be big enough in the religious world because people would say, well, it's a done deal. We, most of us, if we'll take just a moment of inventory, we are blessed far beyond what we deserve, and we are better off than most of the world. God will give you material blessings. I heard someone say, if you just give a thousand dollars, some of yeah, make it if you make it ten thousand, God will really bless you. I was thinking of Paul's life. After he became a Christian, he became the hunted and the persecuted and faced trial after trial after trial. How did he view his life on earth? What was his future view? I want to read this. It's a long reading, but stay with me. Alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood by my side and gave me strength. So that through me, the message might be fully proclaimed that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord rescued me from every evil attack and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. I want us to notice a couple of phrases in verse 18. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack. Paul prayed for that. Now, that didn't mean he had a life of ease. Sometimes he'd wind up in a jail cell. Sometimes he'd wind up just be, being surrounded by a crowd that wanted to kill him. But the point of the last I want to make is he will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. That was what Paul looked for. That was why he followed Jesus. That's why he made his commitment to him the way he did. Because the earthly kingdom, the kingdoms of men at least in the earth are going to fade. But Paul said he will bring me safely to the heavenly kingdom. That's where we want, right? I've heard someone say all of this stuff, social gospel is it's kind of like Aladdin's lamp. You know, if you can rub it enough or shake it enough, you can get out of there what you think you need. From that vantage point, it would be no wonder what Karl Marx called religion the opiate of the masses. But you see, re is again, religion is to bind, being bound again to Christ is not an opiate of the message. Jesus is Lord. Karl Marx didn't like that. People today don't like that because if you say Jesus is Lord, that means you recognize someone greater than yourself and you must submit to them. We're threatened by priests, police or priests. What would we do? Just skip the priests. 
If we're threatened by police, I'm not talking about for a traffic ticket, but whatever. Ed Hort, one of my teachers at Sunset, he used to go to Poland in the early and mid-70s. It, it was a communist country then. He was preaching in there on one Sunday morning, and he said, in came four of these guys, and they stuffed the machine gun right in his face, an AK-47. He said it was about that far from my nose, and they said, get out. And he said, we cleared that facility in about two minutes. And he said, I don't know the point I was going to make before or after, but I got out of the facility. We've never, I've never experienced any of that, even in 15 years of Russia. I was never treated illy by the government, though the local church of Russia hated us very much. The point I'm making is we may be threatened, we might even die for the cause of Christ, but I want to know that in my commitment to Jesus as Lord that I am going to be taken to the heavenly kingdom. Read this with me. Peter, let, let me back up and give you just the background of this. Peter and John in chapter in John 21 are arguing over who's going to live the longest. In chapter 2, they're a team going out talking about Jesus. And they just heal a man who has been lame from his birth. And this is the response. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, the King James says, ignorant and unlearned. They're like, boy, where's the numbers behind your name? What's your PhD? They look at these guys and they realize they don't. But notice the next phrase. They were astonished and took note that they had been with Jesus. Yes. Can anything greater be said? Well, you know, I, yeah, I don't know much about him, but I'll tell you what. I think he and Jesus are on a first name basis. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. Really? So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin, and they're going to have this powwow. They said, verse 16, what are we going to do with these men? Everybody in, living in Jerusalem knows they've done an outstanding miracle, and we can't deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these people to speak no longer to anyone in his name. Then they called them in and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you or rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we've seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They couldn't decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had been done. How come they're not praising God? This is the Sanhedrin. This is the 71 most powerful people at that time in Jewish religion. The man had been born, he had lived all of his life, and all of a sudden he's healed. How come they're not going, hallelujah? Praise God, isn't it amazing? Those who should have been the leaders were not leading at all. They were hating and evil men. It's no wonder. When, when I read stuff like this, it's no wonder that Jesus got in their face sometimes. Never mind. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father, David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord, against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate 
met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. Uh, they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hands and to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, you think? And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Now, these Christians had their moments. They obviously had their difficulties. It hadn't been enough to crucify Jesus. Now they were going after those who were his followers. That's, that's just part of the course. You and I should be expected to be the, the hunted to hunted today. Notice in that verse, they, 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 they pray in unison. You made, you spoke, your word, your hand, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. I'm saying this today, church, not to browbeat us, but to encourage us. No one is persecuting us that I'm aware. We all know of Jesus the Christ. Wouldn't it be exciting if we could share with the kind of passion that these men wanted to share the gospel even in the face of bodily harm? It's not, and I'm not, by the way, splitting hairs or talking about semantics. I'm talking about an attitude. I wish God sometimes I've, I've, I know it's crazy, but I thought if he could just take out my brain and wash it with some heavenly detergent and put it back in, I would be so grateful because I would have an empty thing to learn. And I if I could keep one little piece in there, it would be learn good stuff. I, because I'm the reason I said I wish he could do that. Is sometimes I think if Jesus is not the center of my brain. I mean, he's not the center of my thought process. And if he's not, then there must be something wrong with my thought process. Be like the people, remember? They thought the earth was flat. Or the medieval people who thought, you know, the, the earth was the center and everything revolved around them. I'm telling you, they were wrong. Jesus is the son of and we revolve around him. We need to be keenly, keenly aware and to acknowledge what it is God would like to have from us. I sat there last night and I just sat in my chair and I thought, God, what, what do you want from me? What, what better can I do? What? What more? I, I just, I need to know. And my thought, well, Jerry, you've got it in your hand. But I think it's the spirit, the attitude. If we're willing to want to share the Lord, we can say, Lord, please help me find the person to just tell them about Jesus. Somebody that's hurt and down and out. Somebody that's sick and on their way out. Somebody should be excited to know about Jesus in our world. I'll try to illustrate this way. Suppose you're at a wedding, and as the vows begin, the man taking the vow says, I accept this woman as my personal cook and my personal dishwasher. <laughs> and she's going to say, stop. I'll wash dishes, and I'll clean house. But there's a whole lot more to me than being a maid. Now we'll see if this transfers. The same is true with Jesus. 
We want Jesus as Savior. We should get up every morning and the first words of our lip are, ought to be, thank you, Lord, for another day and thank you that I'm free from sin. I don't know anyone that isn't excited about having Jesus as Savior. But there's more to Jesus. There is the kingdom of which he's the head. You and I, men and women of that kingdom, and Jesus was all about the kingdom and his business. We need to be about the kingdom and his business. Is it really that hard? We can't cut Jesus into little pieces. I've done that. It doesn't work well. And take what I want. Everybody will recognize this. Is there anyone that didn't lick the, the filling out of the center and toss the cookie? Take what we want. I can't do that. When Peter finished his sermon on the first day, there's something that he made abundantly clear. And I, I've got part of it, but I always missed a little piece. He said this, therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God made him both Lord and Savior, Jesus, whom you crucified. He makes that so clear because not only did they recognize their sinfulness, but they recognized part of their sin was crucifying their Lord. If Jesus came back, I believe we would do it again today and we might do it faster. When the people heard this, they're cut to the heart. They want to know what to do. The New Century Translation said when the people heard this, they felt guilty. Sin can make you feel guilty inside. The Greek word for cut to the heart literally means to pierce thoroughly. I got the message. Talk about powerful. If you just read through Acts chapter 2 and you read through there like, oh, shame on us. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, you will be saved. Faith is powerful. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. He is Lord of every kind of bodily problem, cancer and all. He is Lord of the winds and the waves, even when he's sound asleep in the boat. He is Lord of a walking Peter and a sinking Peter. He is Lord of a little Gentile girl filled with demons. He is the Lord of a Thomas who had not seen Jesus. You know, the other people are saying, well, you know, yeah, the Lord's been resurrected. And Thomas goes, yeah, right. And Jesus appears and he says, Thomas, go ahead, put, your, put it in, in my fingerprints. Put your hand on my side. You remember Thomas's next words? My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Jesus is Lord of the living. He's Lord of the dead. Jesus is Lord of everything in your life. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That'll happen one day. It won't be some long, drawn-out court scene. Jesus will appear in the blink of an eye. I'll know exactly my relationship with him. I already know it now. I don't have to guess. But for some people standing there, it will be like, wow, you really were real. 
So if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we, here's the key word, belong to the Lord. Christ died and returned to life so that he might be Lord. Christ returned for this purpose, for this reason. Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. Praise God. Is Jesus your Lord? If he's your Lord, live like he's your Lord. If he's not your Lord, make him your Lord. Surrender yourself in humility to him. If you feel like you just haven't gone anywhere and things are going nowhere, Jesus will take you somewhere and use you in his life, in your life. We're going to sing a song of invitation. I don't know what your needs are, but if Jesus isn't your Lord, think about it while we stand and sing.